I became an actress by default, I guess. It wasn't a career choice, it wasn't even a conscious decision. But I can tell you what happened. I was in high school in uh, New York City. I was attending a private school called uh, Professional Children's School. People always imagine like fame or, you know, high school of LaGuardia where people are thinking kids are like dancing in the hallways and on the cafeteria tables. And it wasn't like that. The school was basically designed <clears throat> for students who had schedules that conflicted with regular academic hours. Mine was that way because I was pursuing a dance career. Um, I was a scholarship student at Alvin Ailey Institute and I had a very intense dance class schedule so I was going to this school because it was a great art school and because I could also pursue my dream to be a dancer. And one day I was coming down the staircase um, in the building and there was a bulletin board and occasionally I would peruse it and on the bulletin board that day was a description of um, you know, ethnic girl, looking, seeking ethnic girl, 14 to 16, to appear on the Cosby Show to play um, a girl on the pep squad. And I was like, I fit that description. I've never auditioned for anything other than school plays, but I'm gonna call the number. And I don't know what made me do it other than I had this moment of excitement and I mixed with fear and I thought I should do it just to push myself, really with no expectation. And retrospectively, whenever I have that excitement and fear mix, it usually turns out pretty good. Um, so I called and I described myself and told the woman I saw this notice on the bulletin board and they set up an appointment and I came in and I met with Barry Moss, who was one of the casting directors of the Hughes Moss Agency. And he basically instructed me on how to audition. He's like, these are sides, you read this part, I read that part, and we'll just play around with it. And I was like, okay. And um, I did it, and I remember the first thing he said was, I was pretty good. He goes, I, I'd like you to come back. And so I said, okay, when? And we scheduled an appointment for me to come back, and um, he put me on tape. And then I got a phone call that they wanted me to come back again to go to Kaufman Astoria Studios. And I don't think I even told anyone. I don't, I, I mean, this could have been, <laughs> this could have been a kidnapping parent nightmare. But I was, I, I just kind of went with it. I was like, all right, it seems perfectly normal for me to get into a Lincoln Town car and go to Queens from Manhattan and not tell anybody where I was going. But I was with a bunch of other girls who looked like me. And, um, you know, next thing I know, I was in a prison in Siberia. No, I'm just kidding. But uh, we made it to Kaufman Astoria Studios in Queens and um, we walked down these corridors and I just remember these long white hallways and lots of doors and lots of kind of turns and very kind of cavernous sounding. And I turn this corner and there's a star on the door and there, someone knocks um, and I hear this voice. It says, come in. And it was Mr. Cosby getting a haircut in his dressing room. And we were all ushered in and he lined it, we were lined up and he each asked us um, questions and I answered the question and I was chosen. I was picked <laughs> to be on The Cosby Show, which was the number one show in America. It was season two um, and it changed everything. Before I was married, I went through this dry spell. I didn't work for, I think it was 11 months and that was kind of the longest I'd gone in my career without working. And my husband brought it up the other day because he said I was like a royal pain in the ass because I was basically stalking him. What are you doing? Can I help? Can I do something? <laughs> Just bored and frustrated. I got to this point where I really started feeling like, you know, maybe that was it. Next thing you know, I get this phone call like a week later and my um, agent says, Rick Alvarez called and they want to meet with you. And like, they want to meet with you about playing the role of the mom, Suzanne, on Are We There Yet? And then it was radio silence for a couple weeks. And then um, five days before I was getting married, I got the phone call that I got the job. And it was my first offer. So I literally went from almost hanging up my shoes to my first offer. <laughs> my first huge offer. Like, yeah, we want you to play this role. We don't need you to audition. You're perfect. And I was like, Wow, so, you know, it, it, it's, it, 
bodes well, you hear often in your lifetime, not even as an actress, but in life you always hear it's always darkest before the dawn and, you know, keep on keeping on and, and all that kind of stuff. But that was one of those moments that I remember where I was just like kind of ready. I, I had almost, um, I had almost not gotten complacent, but I had almost kind of acquiesced. And then um, a great opportunity came and one of my most favorite jobs that I've ever done in my career happened, so. I think all of our characters that we pursue their truth, I mean, everybody has a story. And that's, as actors, that's our job. Our job is to tell stories, to tell interesting stories, and to not compromise the truth of what it is these characters are going through. And one of the great things about my career and, and being an actress is I've learned to let go of my vanity um, in ways that a lot of people haven't. Um, Essence Atkins is extremely insecure. Um, I hate red carpets. I hate interviews. You have no idea how much sweat is under my pits right now. Um, I, I hate um, the idea that anyone would believe that I think I'm more interesting than they are. But I love telling stories and I love exploring what it is that justifies people's behavior, even the worst behavior. So every time, I mean, it's not just a role, it's, it's, it's every character. I try to look for what is the story that they're telling themselves? What, is the, what are the choices that they've made that have brought them to this junction? And why is it interesting to, to talk about it? Um, you know, we're not, we're not really telling stories about people who've read self-help books and got it all together. Though That wouldn't be very interesting. Uh, we want to talk about brokenness and humanity, and we want to talk about um, love longing and, and, and betrayal. We want to talk about interesting emotions and interesting aspects of what it is to be human and to connect or, or not connect, to be understood or to be misunderstood. So every time something comes across my desk, I really try to remember that. I think it's made me a better person. I think that I have a very big heart and I think that um, I am very empathetic and you know I think about situations and I read about situations and I encounter people and I have a greater sense of compassion because I think I really do understand from practice even from all these years of pretending to be someone else it's very easy for me to project myself into someone else's shoes even someone despicable so to speak so uh, I'm really Oh, I'm gonna get choked up, I'm sorry. I'm really grateful for what acting has given me because I think it's made me a better person, a more compassionate person. Yes, I do think that black women and black people are stereotyped within the industry, um, but I think the industry does that across the board, you know, and the stories that, that permeate and the stories that resonate with us are the stories where we see pieces of ourselves and I think that that can happen in anyone's story. Um, and we can be moved um, to have an empathy and, and, and to feel a connection to anyone's story when we move past those stereotypes. But the thing that is, is disheartening to me and alarming to me is the nastiness and the kind of um, the bravado the, that people have in remaining anonymous and saying nasty things with Twitter or you know, even um, social media outlets and stuff like that, commenting on news stories. Those are the things that really frighten me because I think that people have just gotten so mean and it's especially hurtful and harmful um, for me as a black actress when I see it happening amongst ourselves. You know, when I see us kind of um, denigrating our sisters and p picking people apart, you know, uh, her weave looks like crap, or she's fat, or, you know, just being very shallow and very nasty um, in terms of the things that we say about people, and just forgetting these are people with heartbeats and feelings and experience and, and, and life, and, and n I don't know if they take into consideration that we read this stuff. I mean, I know we're not supposed to, and they say, oh, don't read it, whatever, but we do. You know, it's very hurtful to hear and to 
had to be talked about and picked apart, especially within our own community, within our own sisterhood, because um, Hollywood is still, as much progress as we've made, there's still a lot of, um, there's still a lot of kind of old dinosaurs ruling <laughs> that are holding on to the old regime, and there aren't enough opportunities for people of color. Um, and there aren't enough avenues for us to tell our stories that are being greenlit and paid for and compensated by um, the people in charge um, who are by far and large white Americans. So because of that, it's so much more, I don't know, painful to come home and be slapped across the face. Um, and when I say home, I mean to be amongst ourselves in our communities and and be picked apart. So that's the part that I, that breaks my heart. Leaving New York, um, I started working, I, the, my first project, I worked in LA, I was 19 years old. I did a pilot with Debbie Allen, Diane Carroll, Cab Calloway, John Witherspoon, Jennifer Lewis, um, Journey Smollett. Yeah, I'm a dinosaur, I've been around a long time. There's probably all kind of fossils around me somewhere, but, um, this is a great pilot for NBC that Debbie was the star of and, and executive produced, one of the executive producers. And it didn't get picked up, but I say all that to say I came out to LA for pilot season hoping to get a job and I got this job and, and had a great time doing it. But um, I didn't want to leave New York. You know, like so many people, it's, it's, it's difficult to leave home. It's difficult to leave what you know. And you know, growing up in New York City and, and coming from Brooklyn, there were still girls and friends of mine who had never left the neighborhood who would be like, you're going to Manhattan? Like, they wouldn't, they were afraid to get on the subway and go to Manhattan. So let alone leave New York City, leave New York State. So there was a comfort zone in being with what's familiar, what you've grown up with. And I think we all have that. It takes courage to leave home and pursue your dream. A lot of people have a hard time relinquishing that familiarity to pursue their dream. So when it comes to risk, I would say that that was a big one for me. I certainly didn't want to move to Los Angeles where I really didn't know anybody um, and I didn't have any family here and I didn't have anybody to really kind of usher me through except for my manager who was here. But besides that, you know, it was starting a whole new, forging new friendships and, and, and uh, learning a whole new community so that was that was a risk but it was definitely well worth it what is it that you want because I think in order to achieve something you have to really know what's motivating you and what it is you really want if you want to be a celebrity there are plenty of ways to be a celebrity if you want to be famous there are plenty of ways to be famous if you want to make money and be rich there are plenty of ways to do that too and most of the time acting is not one of them especially if you're a brown person. So keep that in mind if you decide you want to be an artist and you want to be an actor. I'm Essence Atkins and I am a black actress.